1 Corinthians 1, 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. Verse 13, underline it. This is the whole key. Paul is going to wrap 16 chapters, and we are going to wrap 20 weeks into one verse right here. Paul, at the very end of his letter, he's get, he's, he's, he has a, a scribe that's, that he's transcribing this letter to, and the, the scribe is writing this down, and Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is thinking of things at the very end going, so they're at the end of the scroll, and, and Paul's got to kind of stuff the last few little words in as the end of the scroll's coming up, because they would make them certain lengths. And so he stuffs this little, beautiful verse in at the very end of the letter. Verse 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Verse 14, let all you do be done in what? Let all you do be done in love. He, he condenses tw- 16 chapters in, in condensing 20 weeks for us, bam, into two verses, 13 and 14. Verse 15, now I urge you, brothers, that you know the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, which is where Corinth is. Uh, that's the ancient um, label for uh, where Greece is by Athens, just south of Athens. The subject, uh, Achaia, that they, have, that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints, be subject to such men as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus, and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. For they have refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such men. The churches of Asia gr- send you greetings. Aquila and, Pris- and Prisca, together with the churches in their house, send you a hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the single people. All right. You're like, praise God for that verse, right? Greet one another with a holy kiss. Verse 21, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. So he's writing the very end of this letter, he's signing it with his own hand, his own John Hancock, if you will, at the, end of, at the end of the letter. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. And that is the, that is the, the, the word there, Maranatha. So you see that word sometimes in a school or whatever it means. It means our Lord, come. Come, Jesus, again. Verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful way to end the letter? That last sentence. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Number one, the aha moment. So what is our last two aha moments for our whole book? And what would have been the last two aha moments uh, for the Corinthians as this letter ends? What is the purpose of generosity? What is the purpose of generosity? Now, for many of us, we did not grow up in Christian homes. Uh, we may have grown up in homes that did not go to church or did not give. Uh, you grew up in a, with parents that were like, hey, this is the money I made, and this is the money I'm going to spend, and this is the money that's going to bless me. And so growing up, you're like, oh, money's all about me. Generosity, as long as I can be generous to myself, that's pretty much what money's here for. And so... I love how Paul breaks generosity down. He doesn't guilt them. He doesn't say, hey, if you're not given, then you're a piece of dirt. 
He says, hey, generosity is the key. And let's look at that this morning. During the first century, the Jewish Christians in Judea, and specifically Jerusalem, had fallen on hard financial times. Either because of a famine or some measure of persecution, many had become very needy. Typically, Jewish merchants and businessmen working abroad would send home money to give to the support of the temple and alms for the poor. Similarly, as Paul traveled and planted churches around the world, he would raise funds to help hurting Christian churches. So many of us grew up in homes that did not have a lot of money. We may be growing up in homes right now that don't have a lot of money. Many of us grew up in homes where it's like all the other kids were getting like new shoes for school. And you knew that you were going to have to stuff your feet and curl your toes in for one more year into the shoes that you had since sixth grade. But now you're two feet taller than you were in sixth grade. But because mom and dad couldn't afford to even go down to pay less or, you know, hit Walmart or whatever, you knew that you were going to have to go through another year with the same clothes, with the same shoes. You had to have your brother cut your hair or whatever and your hair always looked jacked up. Like some of us know what it's like to to, to be raised in a home with either a lot of kids or not a lot of money or both. And I love how Paul says this here, that the church, watch, watch how beautiful this is. The church, if you're a part of a church, and I, and I need to circle back and grab you if, if you haven't been at our church very long. Our church is not a religious organization. Our church is an organism that, that reaches out with the love of Christ. So, ready? Walk with me. You're not here because you're just putting in your religious time, okay? You're not going to get a star on a little board somewhere that, you came to church today, congratulations. You're not making God happy. You're not making me happy. You're not making anybody else happy other than the fact that you should be here to worship with other people and to learn what God has for your life. So the church is an organism, meaning it's living. It does things. It's not an organization where we all just get together and go in a holy huddle and go, hey, we're at church today. Okay, cool, let's go to lunch. The point of the church is to move and be active. It's alive. It's living, like you're living. The church as, a, as an organism is living. It reaches out to love people. And one of the ways that we love people is we are generous. This church is a generous church. It's not a stingy church. It's not a church that spends all money on itself. It's not a church that says, I'm just going to take care of self. It says, we are going to bless others. We, have, we take care, well, we don't personally, but we're part of an organization that takes care of 50,000 churches around the world. And many of them can't even afford to have lights on. They're meeting in a hut. They're meeting in a basement with candles because they're either in a persecuted country or they're dirt poor, literally. So part of what we do is to help organizations that start churches and support the pastors and the churches that meet there. And here's the thing. If we didn't care about that, we would say, we need to spend all on self. But we, through our collective giving, reach out around the world and we reach out locally. We are a generous church. This church, two years ago, we were meeting at Moraga. And I was talking to, to Pastor Larry about this, who's been here since Jesus went back to heaven. Uh, you know, we were talking about this particular issue, because we meet at staff meeting every Tuesday. And uh, we were talking about this, this particular issue a couple weeks ago, that uh, two years ago, when we were all at the Moraga campus, uh, we were about 140 people. Uh, the budget was like 280 or like a dream budget was over $300,000, right? Some of you guys make that by yourself, right? Our whole church's budget was 300 grand. And now, through the generosity of our people, through the last two years, we have exploded in growth, but our growth has not just been numeric, but it's also been financial, which if you've been around church a while, that never happens. You can have explosive numerical growth, but you're still, you're still operating at about a microscopic budget. But the generosity of God's people has gone with our numerical growth too. We have exploded numerically, but we've also exploded in generosity, which those almost never go together. One, finances almost always lag behind, significantly in most cases. And I want you to see something here. God's doing something so spectacular here at the orchard, not just bringing people in, but people's hearts are changing, so they go, how can I help? And I talked to Bill about... Uh, 
the, 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 not just the financial side of generosity, but the giving of time side. Is that we have more people involved in ministry here than anywhere I've ever been in my whole life. That we had over 100 people sign up when we moved here. Now, we didn't come here because, yay, we get to go be at a middle school. Churches never leave property they own and come to a middle school on purpose. It's usually the opposite. You start in a middle school, you start in elementary, you beg God for some land, and then you move there and build buildings, right? You never go the other way. Already have land and building, let's go to a middle school. Even the Holy Spirit's like, what are you doing? But we do that not for comfort's sake, we do that for the sake of the gospel so we can fit more people in to hear the great news of Jesus and to have them connect in our community. Because we literally don't want to say, oh, we're full now, go somewhere else. And if you can't find a place, sorry, you can't have a church to belong to. So I love the idea of generosity. What you're sitting in this morning is generosity. The, churches, the, the church bought those chairs that, you're, that your buns are now somewhat settled into the church has provided everything but you are the church you see what i'm saying it's not some magical church out there it's you it's you you are the church you are the generosity of god to others as the corinthians were better off financially than most churches paul asked them to give above uh, their normal support of their own local church and pastors for believers in Judea who needed it. And uh, if you see in verse 1, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, uh, this is not your normal offering. So the word there, logia, uh, literally means like, um, uh, like a charitable offering. So once they would take the offering for their own pastors uh, and their own ministries at their church, they would take another offering, a, another collection, a, a charitable collection saying, Hey, Brothers and sisters in, in Jerusalem are hurting. We need to help them. And so after they've taken care of their own family, they want to make sure they can take care of other families as well. As, when they realize they can take care of their own church, then they want to take care of other churches. It's like kind of you and your neighborhood. If you live in a nice neighborhood uh, where, where, where people are friendly and you've got a neighbor or whatever that falls on hard times, you know, uh, husband's away at war or he dies or... You know, she's an old lady, and now she's, she's become a widow or whatever. People in your cul-de-sac or on your street or at your apartment building or in your townhomes, they come and they knock on the door, and they go, gosh, uh, how can we help? Do you need a meal? It's the idea of being neighborly and connecting with other people in, in their time of need because that's exactly what you would want, right? If you fell on hard times, you wouldn't want your neighbors to go, I'm just going to stay in my own little world. I'm going to keep my little cans of ragu, and I'm not going to share. You yourself would go, why in the world aren't my neighbors helping me? I'm an old lady. I can't even mow my own lawn. My lawn's three feet high. Why isn't somebody, why can't some of those 18-year-old kids on my street running up and down skateboarding, why can't they put their hands to the plow or a mower and mow my lawn? You would go, hey, <laughs> Some of you guys are like, I'm not even in need, and my son would be great if he'd do that. Put your hand to the plow, or the mower in this case. Take care of that lawn, son. We, we expect that. In fact, we're offended when we need help, and other people go, ah, I'm good. Hope you can make it. And that's the exact same way that we should be, whether you live in a great neighborhood or a bad neighborhood. I, when Julie and I were first married, man, we lived in a sketchy neighborhood. They were literally doing drug deals. We literally, true story, Julie and I are walking to our car in the parking lot. Uh, a lady walks over to us like this. I'm walking with Julie like, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. She goes, hey, uh, my son... My, 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 my young son is at this house in Arroyo Grande, because yeah, we were in San Luis Obispo at the time. He's, she, he's in Arroyo Grande, and, uh, you know, I could really use a ride out to see him because, you know, he doesn't have his mom. Why is your son out in Arroyo Grande without you, his mother? Where's dad at? Oh, you know, dad's not in the picture and stuff, and blah, 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 blah. So me being young and naive but having my antennas up, I'm going... 
okay, she's about, you know, a buck oh five wet, so I think I could take her. So, um, so, so we get in the car, right? And I'm driving on the 101 to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to down to, uh, to Arroyo Grande from San Luis Obispo. So she's, I had her sit in the front seat, and Julie's sitting in the back going like this to me at an angle going, you know, I'm hoping Julie will reach around and, you know, strangle her or whatever from the back seat. You know, if I start getting in trouble, she pulls a knife or a gun or whatever. It's a true, real story. Uh, so we get off in Arroyo Grande, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, okay, one, if there's really a kid out here somewhere, uh, she'll be so happy to be reunited with her son. If this is not a pickup kid deal, then it'll be sketchy. Well... It was pretty sketchy. We drove out to this house in the middle of nowhere with its shades pulled down. And you know the kind of house I'm talking about where they like change the uh, you know, oil and the uh, transmission fluid out in the front yard or whatever. And it just looks sketchy and things are really... We pull up there and I'm going, wow, 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 wow. There ain't no kid in that house. And if there is, he's dead. So it don't matter anyway. So she gets out and she goes, I'll be back in a little bit. I go, see ya, you're with your kid now. He's safe, I'm out of here. So I left her at this house in Arroyo Grande because we, we, we were, that could have been our last stop as a couple at that house. And, and the thing I want you to see here is even when I thought I was in a sketchy situation, my heart was for being generous. I, I, I always want to default to generosity. I'd never want to default to it's not, it's not convenient for me. It's not something I want to do. I, wa- I want to always err on the side of generosity. I never want to err on the side of stingy. And I, wanna, I want to be smart, but I always, if there's a question, I always want to err on generosity side. Because I believe that's what God does for us, right? One, God's never fooled. But God always is generous to you when he doesn't have to be, right? I mean, none of us do enough good stuff where God goes, I'm going to be super generous to you because you're awesome. I mean, God's just liberally generous to us. And it doesn't have to be. So that's the whole idea of Christian generosity. It's not about guilt giving. It's not about like, wow, if I don't give some money, then God's going to be mad. It's like you give because of the great generosity that God has had for you and me. Historically, uh, it's a, for the sake of integrity, Paul did not want to handle the offering while traveling or control the distribution of it at Jerusalem. And I want you to see this cool little verse that uh, Paul puts in there. Um, Look what, he, look what he says in verse 3. And when I arrive, so he's coming to Cor- Corinth to pick up the money, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. You know what I love about that? Is Paul was a man of integrity. He didn't go to Corinth going, yeah, you know, collect some money and uh, I'll deliver it myself. And you know, so if there's, say, $10,000 worth of gold and silver in there, by the time it gets to Jerusalem, there's like uh, $15 left or whatever, like, oh, I don't Oh, Corinth was really cheap this year. They just gave you 15 bucks. But I'm wearing this sweet new robe. You know what I love about Paul? He goes, you know what? You write a letter, how much, is, how much you guys gave. You guys authorize it, because the people I'm bringing it to, some of them will know you. You say, okay, there's 10 grand in this bag. We're sending this with Paul and this guy and this guy and this guy. So when it reaches you, I send you a greeting, and you open it, and you go, oh, there should be 10 grand in here. Johnny, is there 10 grand? Count it out. 10 grand. I love that about Paul. Is he wasn't like, oh, I'll just control it. And maybe, uh, you know, if I, get, if I get hungry, I'll take a little bit out of this, this old sack right here. I love that about Paul. You could trust Paul. And sadly, you can't say that about a lot of, a lot of uh, men in the ministry. On purpose... I don't control any money here at the church. I don't have a church checkbook. I have a, I have a, I have a way that I can spend money, but it's within budget. I, don't, I can't go to the bank. I'm not even on the, I'm not even able to go to the bank and withdraw money from the church. I'm on nothing. And I do that for the sake of integrity. Other elders and pastors in the church, they're on that so they can, you know, with accountability, do what needs to be done to, to, for, the, for the sake of the church. But the reason I say that is because I love Paul's example. Paul was a stinking apostle. He just wrote the scripture I'm teaching. 
If there's ever a guy that you could probably trust on his own, it's going to be Paul, right? But even Paul, for the sake of what it looked like, how much do we really know was in that bag? For the sake of what it looked like, he took other guys with him, and he had the, 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 the senders send a letter with him. Isn't that awesome? You don't really find many men like that, and that's sad. Men that go, I'm trustworthy enough, but for the sake of what other people may view it as, I safeguard myself. And I safeguard the sake of the gospel, right? I don't run around with, with a pot of gold myself. Historically, Christians give the most, have started more hospitals, schools, and relief organizations than anyone else, all to help those who cannot help themselves and will never be able to repay the kindness they have been shown. Show me where the atheist hospital is. Where is the atheist organizations of orphans? Where are all the schools in the third world countries started by the sexy atheists? Where's all the money coming from to help the Katrina victims from the atheist crowd? Where are all the people being butchered in the world where aid is being sent, where you have Muslims giving millions of dollars to help Christians in need? Where's that? Because I can tell you that around the world where Muslims control the area, they are invited into those schools. They are invited into those hospitals. And you know why that is? Because the love of Christ is real. It's not manufactured. It's not religion. It's actual relationship. And when you have a relationship with somebody, it motivates you from the inside out. And guess what? It also motivates your wallet from the inside out. Right? Because a lot of us like to talk big game. Oh, I follow Jesus. Oh, you do? Jesus is Lord of my life. Are you sure? Yep. How do you know? Because it says so right here in my living room. Well, that's awesome. Not going to lie. I love the script. Love the calligraphy. But it has to go beyond your little banner. It has to go beyond your little, your little wooden thing that says Jesus is Lord. And guess what? One of the last places Jesus usually becomes Lord is in your wallet or in your coach purse. Right? I mean, Right? Okay, the thing is when you sense the Spirit of God, when you sense that God is moving in your heart and in your life, it affects every area of your life. I'm not telling you how much to give. I'm saying to you that generosity is a focus of life. It's a focus of life when you're a Christian because God is relentlessly focused on being generous to us. And you have a call that I'm ignoring. It was a missed call. It was a missed call, somebody on the worship team. And somebody's getting fired today after this service. Um, generosity has now ended for that person on the worship team. Uh, but here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to see. When everybody talks about, like, I don't believe there's a God, or I believe this person's God, or I believe blah, blah, blah. What it really comes down to is where the rubber meets the road is when you hit your wallet. And you know what? You know who gives the most? Christians give more money than some countries give to their own selves to help their own people. We set up hospitals. You could go to St. Jude or St. whatever or St. this person or that because it was started for the glory of God. Whether you agree with Catholicism or not, it was started with an idea that Jesus is, is the Lord. We give money. Some of the best hospitals in the world were started by Christians. Some of the best schools in the world are started by Christians. You want to know what's crazy? Most Ivy League schools, think of them in your head right now, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, you know what they were, the majority of them were started as? This is going to blow some of your minds because God isn't even allowed really in the door in those schools anymore. You know how they were started? They were started by Christian pastors who wanted to train other young men. They were started as seminaries. And here's my point. My point is, is that Christians give not to get. Christians give because it's for the glory of God. They give because Jesus is real. And when something's real, it affects your whole self. Right? 
God is at work in the world, and believers must join his efforts. Giving should be regular, sacrificial, and joyful. Believers should view their possessions with God as owner, themselves as managers, and generosity as a focus. Withhold nothing from the God who gave everything. You are not the owner of your stuff. Your husband, you do not, he is, he is not to be owned. Your wife is not to be owned. You've been given children. You don't own them. Everything is on loan from the Lord. Your kids are on loan to raise them. Your husband's on loan to honor him. Your wife is on loan to love her. Your, your money is on loan to do with as you please. If it blesses you, great. But don't let your money only bless you. Don't let it only bless you. Let it bless others as well. It's okay if it blesses you, but let it bless others too. And you know, a, a couple weeks ago, I, I brought up this. So 2,000 years ago, they gave little pieces of gold, silver, little stamped coins. Um, up until about a couple hundred years ago, we started our own paper money. Your $20 bill is, is, a, is a special woven. The reason you can run it through the washer and it doesn't degrade like paper is because it's a special cotton. And so... Nobody even carries cash anymore, and if you're under 20, you don't even know what a check, you can't even spell checkbook, right? So we are like one of the first churches that started using these a couple weeks ago, and I showed you this, but I, I want to show you this for this reason, <clears throat> is in every other area of our life, so when I brought this out a couple weeks ago, some people are like, it's the sign of the Antichrist, it's, there's a square station inside the church, well, guess what? You use money with our president's face on it. Remember when Jesus had this issue, when they said, who should we give to? And it had a picture of Caesar stamped on the coin. He said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what's God's. And I, I love this aspect, that this is where we're going. You use your card for everything in the world, right? It's not satanic, it's not whatever, because you use it at like lows, right? Every time you pull your card out, it's like, oh, Satan, I'm, oh, I can't believe I'm giving this to Satan. No, because the plastic just represents the paper cotton money that you would have usually had to go to the bank to get, to pay for something, right? It's just a representation of it. Even the paper money you use is just a representation of theoretically our, gov our government has gold or silver to back up that paper money, right? Because there's no value in the little paper. It's just a representation of it. So here's my point. This is like a way to show generosity. It's just, a, it's another tool. It's another tool. Whether you bring gold, you bring your silver or whatever, like they used to, and put it in the offering plate to help Christians around the world, whether you give actual cash, whether you write a check, whether you swipe your card on here, and, and they, you know what's beautiful about this is it actually sends you an email. And you know what's awesome even? We even send you a, uh, a feedback email going, how was your time at the orchard? Which you can write, awesome, lame. <laughs> you can rate your time at the orchard and how your time was here. Because we send you a follow-up email based on the secure giving that you do through this. And I want to show you this for this reason, is that it doesn't matter how you give. Gold, silver, paper, cotton, uh, use your card like you use it for everything else. The point isn't how you give, the point is that you give. Is that you're generous with what God has given you. Number two, the aha moment. What are the traits of a mature Christian? What are the traits of a mature, mature Christian? We're going to wrap up this whole series with this. What are the traits of a mature Christian? As Paul had led many of the Corinthians to the Lord, he was the instrument God used to bring new life and joy into their lives. However, Paul was also careful to remind them that along with the benefits of knowing God, there would be difficulty and challenges as well. Anybody got difficulty or challenge in your life today? Guess what? God still loves you, and God is still going to do amazing things with you, right? So... Oh, we got one person that's still awake. Praise God. So here's the thing. Even inside difficulty, here's my, here's my point. Paul didn't go to the Corinth. When he walked into the, to the city of Corinth, he didn't go, hey, if you come to know the Lord, everything's going to be awesome. You'll never have a problem. God's going to pay all your bills. You'll never have to work hard. You'll never have to do anything. You could just sit back and watch whatever they watched 2,000 years ago. I'm holding a remote in my hand. I don't even know why. You could just sit on your stone chair and stare at the wall. I don't even know what they did at home in Corinth. You could just do whatever you want to do because God's going to do everything. You're never going to have a problem. You're never going to have a challenge. Guess what? Sometimes when you come to know the Lord, things get worse before they get better. And here's a reason for that. And Larry said a little bit of it uh, during our, our offering prayer is that 
God sometimes uses and leaves difficulty in your life to mature you. Not because God hates you, but because God uses all circumstances, financial, relational, health, to mature you as a man or woman of God. If everything was just your way and you never had any problems, you'd go, oh, I'm pretty awesome. And you wouldn't realize the own wickedness and sinfulness of your own heart. And the way God minds that out is he, he gives you difficulty in your life where you have to rely on him rather than self. Because God is God and not us, right? So when things always go your way, you go, I'm pretty awesome, you're self-focused. When things are out of control for you, you have to rely on God because he's the only one that can control it. You see how that works? So how does God mature us? Glad you asked. As Paul has led many of the Corinthians to the Lord, he was the instrument God used to bring new life and joy into their lives. However, Paul also was careful to remind them that along with the benefits of knowing God, there would be difficulty and challenges as well. Even in a beautiful garden, it takes effort to keep weeds from growing. Anybody had tried to get a garden going? Anybody that, you know, if you got a green thumb, some of you guys, you can just run down to Lowe's, you can throw something in the ground and spit on it, and it grows. And for some of us, we plant something, we buy the right fertilizer, we buy the steer manure, our whole, you know, we, we buy everything, we water it every day, we sing to it, and we have a, like a, a, a black thumb of death that just goes, Mah! it's like the Wicked Witch of the West just starts to, you know, deform right in front of you and die. And we have to keep bringing it back to Lowe's going, I don't know why this thing died, I need to get something new. Good thing for the refund at Lowe's, right, that you can swap your plants out if they die for some of us. Some of us, we just grow it, we just put it in the ground, it grows awesome. Some of us, we put it in the ground, it's like it's dead before it even hits the dirt. And the, the reason I say that is because even when you're doing physical gardening, you have to watch out for weeds. You have to take care of the things that are important, or else the things that are important will die, and the weeds will grow and choke out everything else. So just same thing with life. God will give you your life, you get to choose what you want inside of it, but you've got to continually be weeding out the problems, working on your own self to become a man or woman of God. Paul tells the elders and believers in general to be watchful. So we're going to, go to, we're going to close with this. I want you to look in your own Bible, verse 13. I hope you underlined it, because we're going to walk through this and be done. Piece by piece. He told them to be watchful. And it's the word that means stay awake, like some of you are struggling to right now, right? One of your eyes is starting to droop. That lazy eye you have, it's starting to close right now because you're like the caffeine you drank before you got into the service is now crashing and you need to be able to get like some Red Bull in your system to get back awake, right? The word here in your Bible, the Greek word for, for be watchful, literally means like a soldier or a sentinel on a wall to stay awake. The guy that's guarding the city while everyone else sleeps cannot fall asleep, right? The guy that's doing the protecting's got to stay awake. And 2,000 years ago when this was written, if you're a sentinel or a soldier, you fall asleep, everybody could be dead by the time you wake up. And so the word literally means to t telling the elders and the leaders of the church, hey, 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 stay awake, be watchful, keep your eyes open. Look over the church. Make sure that things are going well. Don't let error creep in. Don't let gossip creep in. Don't let anything that's going to destroy unity creep in. Make sure you stay awake. Because, hey, shepherd, you fall asleep and the sheep are going to get ripped. Be watchful. Like a sentinel staying awake to protect the city or watch over the movements of the enemy so as not to be taken off guard. They were also to stand firm. And I love this word. It's stako. It's, it, it literally means to be stationary. You ever seen like, uh, who are those guys at uh, Palace, Buckingham Palace? Is that where it is? Where they walk around like, it literally means like to be, I just sang a song. Do you like that? That was the Buckingham Palace song. If you miss it, uh, check it out on, online. Uh, it literally means to be stationary, to be like unmovable. It's like men in battle that don't back down. It's that men that take the hill and stay there. It it's, it's literally means to, to be unmoved, to be stationary, to be planted in the ground. Stay awake, stay stationary, stay where you are, stay planted in the ground, and be there. 
not retreating in the face of problems or challenges. The strength of faith is shown in the fire of adversity. Your faith will not grow when you're at ease. Your faith will grow when you're thrown in the fire. The purity of your faith will not be shown in ease. The purity of your faith will be shown when you're boiled in the pot, when your faith is thrown into the fire and it must come forth pure because all the impurities have burned away. As elders and leaders, they were commanded to act like men. I love this. Look at your Bible. This is so awesome. Verse 13. I le- look at those three words. I want you to circle them. Young ladies, all the single ladies. I want you to circle, underline, tear that out, put it in your mouth and eat it, make it part of your DNA. Because you want a man that acts like a man. I love the Greek word there. It literally means a man has a certain way to act. There's a way you can recognize a man, the way you can recognize a woman. There's a way you can recognize a man that does not act like a man, or you can recognize a woman that acts like a man. And Paul's saying here, if you're going to be a man of God, then you better act like a man. That's not, that's not brutal. That's not angry. That's not using his strength inappropriately. It's, it literally means to act the way a man was built to be. The protector, the provider, the lover, the one that uses all of his energy to love his family. The one that uses all of his energy to protect his wife and his home as much as he can. The one that goes and breaks his back for 40 years and has a heart attack at 70 because he gave his, the physical side of his body to the, to the provision of his family. That's what men are called to do. In our, in our day and age, we have a famine of masculinity. We have a lot of grown-up boys. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes, back row. Are you ready? Here it comes. We have a lot of boys. We have a lot of boys that are old, that have had children. We have boys that have children, but we do not have many boys that act like men that have come to masculinity the way God designed it. Not the way humanity designs it. Not the way our society says you got to be macho and you don't listen and you beat up women and you are intimidating and blah, blah, blah. That's not masculinity. That's stupidity. Biblical masculinity is you create safety. You create strength. You create stationary ability so that everyone else, though everyone else falls away, I know I can count on you. Though everyone else is scared and runs, you are the man that stands up. That's biblical masculinity. That's the best of of men. The best of men is the way God built men, the way Jesus was. Not a weakling, not a wussy. He didn't run, he wasn't scared, but he wasn't abusive. And he wasn't overly aggressive. He was a perfect match of what a man is. Act like a man. Act like God's man. Now, to be fair, some of us have never seen a godly example of masculinity in our lives. We're learning all of this for the first time, many of us. Young ladies, make sure you marry a man, if you're not married yet, that loves the Lord. That you can look to and go, that's a man I trust, the man I feel safe around, the man that's going to lead our home towards Jesus and not away from it. Right? And if you are a man today, and you are married, make sure that you are lining up under Jesus as your head. We look to him as the ultimate level of masculinity and go, how can I be like Jesus? I don't look to my dad, all the good and bad of my dad. I don't look to my grandpa or all my homies as masculinity examples. I look to Jesus, right? Because that will weed out my bad traits and strengthen my godly traits, right? Right? Oh, put your hands together for that. Woo! Okay. I close with this. The best aspects of masculinity should be exemplified in the church. There should not be weenie men in the church. Okay? I've been to so many churches where, where the pastor or the youth, the youth guy or the worship guy or whatever was just like, um, okay, I'm going to keep going on. <laughs> to wrap up his encouragement... Everything done in the church should be done with uh, self-sacrificial love. So to wrap up this whole thing, our whole series, the whole book, this whole sermon, everything we do here should be done with love. 
I don't love myself more than I love you. I give of myself to love you. That's what Jesus did. He could have loved self. I'm God. I can love myself. Awesome. Because I'm perfect. But Jesus demotes himself to serve us. In the same way, we demote ourselves to serve others. That's a true church. Not one that just collects people, but one that serves people with the love of God. Isn't that beautiful?